Hi, hello, and welcome to the Word. We have been studying letters Paul wrote to churches and territories away from where he was. He wrote some with Timothy and others when he was in prison. But this time, we see that Paul is writing to this very Timothy, his son, encouraging him to be strong and steadfast in what he's doing. We will take the dive to see what instructions he gave him and how important they are for the household of faith today. Ready to study? Let's get started. As we have discussed many times before, people take one verse or text here and there and apply them to everyone, but that is not how we study. We must look at the whole books or we must look at whole books and chapters to get a gist of the context of the passage. Timothy is one letter that this is done to. Everyone just quotes the text, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This was not written as a command to everyone, but to Timothy, because there were no scrolls available to the believers. They had to rely on what was taught to them and retain the oral information. Paul was not writing scripture when he was writing to Timothy. He was simply sending a letter of encouragement, and we must see it as that. Within that letter holds truths that can be adhered to, but we must be careful how we apply things. Let's get right into it. But before we do, let us pray. Faithful Father, you have done everything for our good. You love us to the extent that you have provided eternal life from the foundation of the world. We praise you again and again for being a great God, providing for us and giving us life on a daily basis. Walk and talk with us as we go along this journey until we reach our destination. Bless us now, we pray, for we ask it in no other name but the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So we are reading from a letter to a person, not a city. So there is no background history except what we know of what Paul mentioned of he having to circumcise Timothy because he was half Jew since his father was a Greek. So based on that, he was not yet circumcised. So even if Paul did not practice circumcision, he had to let him do it, or else the Jews he would have to speak to would not listen to him. This is one of the compromises that we know that Paul had to make to appease to the people he was to win to the gospel. I guess at times we have to make such decisions as we see it fit, but that is not the norm. I guess he used wisdom in this instance. So let us read 1 Timothy 1, starting from verse 1. This letter is from Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, appointed by the command of God our Savior and Christ Jesus, who gives us hope. I am writing to Timothy, my true son in the faith. May God the Father and Christ our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. When I left for Macedonia, I urged you to stay there in Ephesus and stop those whose teaching is contrary to the truth. So by the very words of Paul, we know where they were and where he was going. If you remember, Philippi was in Macedonia, so you could see the distance. So Paul was leaving Timothy in Ephesus so as a spiritual father or a biological father, he's giving him all the counsel he needs for when he has to lead alone. Not just leading, but to thrash and burn anything that is against the truth. We know that there is this argument of what is truth, because those who hold that what they teach is truth can hold that what I teach is error. But remember that truth is not complicated. Verse 4, don't let them waste their time in endless discussion of myths and spiritual pedigrees. 
These things only lead to meaningless speculations, which don't help people live a life of faith in God. The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith. But some people have missed this whole point. They have turned away from these things and spend their time in meaningless discussions. Here we go. Salvation in Jesus is simple, but there are those who have come and made it complicated. They have some complicated doctrinal discussions that only university students can understand. When it's over, it does nothing for daily living. It does not enhance your spirituality. It does not draw you closer to God. This is what Paul is telling Timothy, to keep the church away from that. Tell them to avoid these meaningless discussions. He wants them to focus on love and genuine faith, not in unnecessary discussions. In congregations, there are always those who think that they can pull people into discussions that do not benefit anyone. The same goes for us today. Stay away from foolish discussions. Use your time wisely. Verse 7, they want to be known as teachers of the law of Moses, or simply teachers of the law, but they don't know what they are talking about. Even though they speak so confidently, we know that the law is good when used correctly, for the law was not intended for people who do what is right. Come on, somebody. It is for people who are lawless and rebellious, who are ungodly and sinful, who consider nothing sacred and defile what is holy, who kill their father or mother or commit other murders. The law is for people who are sexually immoral or who practice homosexuality or are slave traders, liars, promise breakers, or who do anything else that contradicts the wholesome teaching that comes from the glorious good news and thrust it to me by your blessed God. All right, all right. He's telling Timothy who was with him, who helped to write to others the same thing about the law and living righteous lives so that he would remember when he is confronted by others. So those who think that they are experts on Old Testament law don't realize that nothing from those laws are applicable to us today. <laughs> the law is for unbelievers to bring them to Christ. Huh. Believers don't need the law when they are in Christ. They already have him who is above and beyond the law. How oh, I love that. Timothy, remember you are walking by faith and faith cannot include the law. You cannot have faith in the law. You can only have faith in Jesus. You must not eat this and not eat, drink that and, and this law and that law. Verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him, even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ. In my insolence, I persecuted his people, but God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that come from Christ Jesus. Paul is reminding him, that he should not be worthy to be counted because of what he did in his zealousness for the Lord. But God is so loving, hallelujah, that he gave him a second chance so we could be doing things zealously for the Lord and very wrong. When we find out that we are wrong, we should make that change as best and as quick as possible. Paul was arrested to make that change. Maybe God has to arrest us to make that change. I know he arrested me. Verse 15. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Come on, somebody then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. 
all honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. Yes, he's correct. Salvation is in this one statement. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. End of story. That is the gospel. That is the truth that we must all be willing to die for and teach. But Paul acknowledged that even if he was highly spiritual and killing on behalf of God, he was the worst of all sinners and God was patient with him by extending mercy to him. So those who think they can be worse than Paul when they have never even killed a cow will realize that they can have salvation too. But he says further, that God, who is that Father, is forever. He's eternal and never dies, and he alone is God. In Philippians, Paul said Jesus was in the form of God, and here he tells Timothy that he alone, the Father, is God. So we have to try to understand the true meaning of Jesus being God. So I normally say he's in the realm of godness and not angels, nor man. But God the Father alone is supreme. Timothy my son, verse 18, here are my instructions for you based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier. May they help you fight well in the Lord's battles. Cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their consciences. As a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. Hymenaeus and Alexander are two examples. I threw them out and I handed them over to Satan so they might learn not to blaspheme God. So Timothy had someone prophesy on his life and Paul is using this to remind him of his calling. While you cling to your faith, keep your conscience clear. So there is a relationship with your conscience and your faith because these two men had their faith shipwrecked. Why? Because their consciences were not clear. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. What we want you, my gentle people, is to do is to examine what you already know with someone who can go through scripture with you. And if what you are already taught is firm on scripture, stick to it. But if what you read does not, or what you read does not correspond with what you are taught, don't dilly-dally, walk away from it and accept that which is truth. 1 Timothy 2. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Come on. That's a good counsel. Pray for everyone. So Timothy was advised to pray for not just his people, but others, including those in authority. We should take example of this and do likewise when we pray. So it pleases God when we pray for others and when we live peacefully. God wants everyone to be saved. I like that. Everyone, not some. And what is truth? Truth is not what some of us put together and consider a package of truth. Truth is that Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, is the Savior of the world. Verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity. That is the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. You hear it? One God, one mediator. So the role of Jesus is to reconcile us to God. This is the center of the gospel. The Father who gave the Son to reconcile himself with us. And the Holy Spirit who makes all of that happen by connection to our spirit. However, Jesus is not an angel nor a human. He is still in the realm of godness. I have to make it clear. That is the best way I can put it to keep the distinction in your mind. Verse 7. I have been chosen as a preacher and apostle to teach the Gentiles this message about faith and truth. I'm not exaggerating. Just telling the truth. In every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. 
And I want women to be modest in their appearance. They should wear decent and appropriate clothing and not draw attention to themselves by the way they fix their hair or by wearing gold or pearls or expensive clothes. Pause. Now you know I have to give this some attention because this is a sore thumb among churches. So Paul is saying, I'm not exaggerating anything, but I'm telling you the truth. Remember what he's about to say is not found in a law that we can go look at. Remember, our walk with Jesus Christ is on a whole different level. Some people feel that the no law principle means do as you like. Paul has never advocated that. He never did. He keeps telling us that God has taught him and given him the theology of what it means to walk by faith in Jesus. So what we are hearing is from the Lord to Paul. He has been given that mandate. So he is not just speaking out of turn or what he wants. So when you worship, there must be no controversy and people being angry with each other. I want you to be free when you worship God, he said. Any disputes, you must cut it out. So Timothy is directed as to how worship must be conducted. And then he shifted to the women, the way women must dress. So he's telling him women should be decent and appropriate in their dress. And the main point here is not drawing attention to themselves by the way they do their hair. He also says, or by wearing of gold or pearls or expensive clothes. The only way women wear pearls and gold is in the form of the ornamental jewelry. So Paul is condemning the wearing of jewelry, which normally comes in gold or pearls around your neck. Now, if you notice, basically, all the Christian women wear jewelry. You remember when we discussed jesting where Paul said it must not be tolerated among you? And we repented of that? Well, this here is no exception. I'm speaking to women who claim to be believers in Jesus. If you do, then walking in Jesus, Paul says, not me, Paul says, means that you are not to wear these things for they are an indication of an outward show of your beauty, bringing attention to yourself. It must not be practiced among women of faith. That's what he said. So be careful now that you consider all that Paul has said before to be coming from God, but now you decide that this is just a counsel and that he's given and you don't necessarily have to take it. If Paul mentions that women should not be seen by wearing these things, he would have had to be speaking on a knowledge from the Lord that this is not the way women of God should be adorned or dressed. He actually gave the reason. Women must be modest. Why didn't he say the same thing for men? Because men never wore these things for attention or outward show. So there was no need to tell them so. It's the women who had that kind of weakness. Now, everybody wears these things today. So in this day and age, we have to go further to say no one must wear these things because God expects us to be modest. Now men have earrings, chains, everything. So Timothy was to tell the women in the congregations that when they dress, they should not put on these things. It was not uh, if you choose to or not. It simply is prohibited. Why? Verse 10, for women who claim to be devoted to God should make themselves attractive by the good things they do. Women should learn quietly and submissively. I do not let women teach men or have authority over them. Let them listen quietly. You see why I told you that Paul repeats the same thing to the different territories? He said this before to the Corinthians about women not teaching and learning in submission and having um, authority over men. We can't be happy for Paul over there for giving us theology and counsel. And when it comes here, 
we decide that we don't want to take it or we don't have to take this. I remember someone saying that Paul was expressing what was happening in the society at this time. So we cannot take Paul too hard and fast here. Well, let me tell you, Paul, like Jesus, never cared about what the society believed or practiced. They were standing against society and were persecuted and killed for it. Paul counseled based on instructions from God himself. Paul's arguments are normally based on scripture and creation, not on what was happening in the society. So to soften Paul's teaching by stating that he was just doing according to society is totally unacceptable to the believer, to us. So ladies of all faiths who push the concept of this is not based on salvation, Paul is saying if you are devoted to God, which is your walk in Christ, which is salvation, then you have to put them away. No outward display. So stop bossing your pastors around. And pastors, stop allowing the members to control the narrative of the walk in Christ. It has to stop. When we are given instructions from the Lord, we must adhere to it, whether we like it or not. Your walk in Jesus excludes you wearing jewelry for ornamentation. That's what it is. There is no argument. There is only obedience. So share this with your Christian sisters all around the world who try to make excuses that they are not wearing much and it's just a little this and a little that. No, stop it. If the sisters choose to not come back to your congregation because of this, so let it be. We are not serving women. We are serving God. So as we said, Paul is not speaking arbitrarily or speaking based on the society of his day. This is an excuse used by those who want to excuse sin. Listen to his argument. Verse 13, For God made Adam first, and afterward he made Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived by Satan. The woman was deceived, and sin was the result. But women will be saved through childbearing, assuming they continue to live in faith, love, holiness, and modesty. You hear that? Again, a total creation argument. Adam was made first. Eve was deceived. These two arguments have nothing to do with society and male chauvinism. They are rooted in God and creation. So women have their role and will be saved by their role. It's not their role when it comes to teaching the word of God. So that is why men have to get more serious. Men are leaving these matters for women. No, it's your job. Balance your life. Stop running after the money and not after the spirituality. Stop running after the pleasures of life and start focusing on the righteousness in Christ. You can do better, men. It has nothing to do with your education or your money. It's your role that God has given you. Paul spanned all the generations that existed and went straight to creation. He passed the time when Israel was under the law. He passed the intertestamental period. He passed the time of Jesus and came to his day and now left it for us. Women are to be submissive, not because God does not like women by creating Adam first. He meant that man must be the head and she having been tricked by the devil made the point even stronger that she must submit. Single parenthood has caused women to assume the role of man, but it should not be. Let's give men their rightful position. Timothy was to guide the people in these things. He did not tell him to read this to the people. He was guiding him as to how to lead the people. The most stubborn of the two genders is women. That is why they have to be placed under submission by God. Her argument and discussion with the forbidden serpent was the foot in the door for the devil to get a hold of Adam. Since he was responsible, he paid for it. Look at where we are today. So she continues to be placed under submission 
and must not share her opinion and emotions as facts. You leave them to that end and everything will be turned on its head. Straight talk. And husbands and pastors, just like Adam, make a huge accommodation because they don't want to offend their wives or their women. So from today, this, I don't see it this way. I like my jewelry. What if he meant this or that? Must stop. Newsflash, women and men of faith do not wear ornamentation or jewelry. Case closed. Remember, Paul said, some preach this gospel with the wrong motive, some to please others, some for gain, not this one. Chapter 3, verse 1. This is a trustworthy saying. If someone aspires to be a church leader, he desires an honorable position. So a church leader must be a man whose life is above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife. He must exercise self-control, live wisely, and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home, and he must be able to teach. He must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. He must be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not love money. He must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? Remember, Timothy is young and does not even have a wife and children. Based on what we are reading here, he's not yet married. So Timothy has stayed back to help the congregation. Paul is saying to him, if any of the men aspire to be a leader, that is good. It means he has a desire to serve God. But he must remember that that man must have some qualities that are important. He must be faithful to his wife, self-control, good reputation, hospitable, not drinking too much and must not love money. That's important. Remember what Paul said about greedy people who love money? It's like idolatry. Based on what Paul just said to Timothy, can he ever have meant that a woman can be accepted in that position. Absolutely not. So that is where the problem lies. It's in those who read out of context and try to let the words fit what they want. How can you now say that this could also refer to women? Are you out of your mind? Is the devil sitting on your brain? Nothing here is generic. So if you feel that Paul is saying this because he is influenced by the status quo of his day, then you can feel justified in turning it around. But as we have already established, Paul's teaching is from God. And it starts from creation and maintains that same principle like marriage is from creation. And maintains that same principle. Verse 6, a church leader must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fall. Also, people outside the church must speak well of him so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. So no novices in this thing. There must be enough spiritual maturity to be able to maintain your spiritual integrity or else the devil will make mincemeat with you. Verse 8, in the same way, deacons must be well respected and have integrity. They must not be heavy drinkers or dishonest with money. They must be committed to the mystery of the faith now revealed and must live with a clear conscience. Before they are appointed as deacons, let them be closely examined. If they pass the test, then let them serve as deacons. Deacons are helpers. If your congregation has grown like these would have, then elders and deacons would be needed, and these are the qualifications. Verse 11, in the same way their wives must be respectful and must not slander others, they must exercise self-control and be faithful in everything they do. You hear this? In the same way their wives 
So Paul has no intentions of expecting their wives to be the leader and the husband to be the spouse in support. In the same way, wives must be respectful and exercise self-control and be faithful. So there is a distinction between a husband and a wife in the role of the leadership and deaconry. There is no concept after the death of Jesus and the growth of the believers of anything called deaconess. The deacons did what they had to assist the elders in distribution. Now, you create a role for women because everything must be balanced and complicate everything that was so simple. Leaders or bishops are males. Deacons, males, and everyone had a wife. So now that you have complicated things, you go further to complicate them and argue for the ordination of the laying of hands. The devil is a liar. I understand why God must have voices like this crying out in the wilderness. Because all denominations have failed God in twisting of scripture and spiritual counsel to satisfy their personal desires or that pressure of their women to be equal with men. So help us, Lord. Verse 12, a deacon must be faithful to his wife and he must manage his children and household well. Those who do well as deacons will be rewarded with respect from others and will have increased confidence in the faith in Christ Jesus. Exactly. The deacon is faithful to his wife and manages, not the wife faithful to her husband and manages. We got women walking about this place and around the world claiming that God has called me to do this and to be this and that leader in congregations and their husbands running after them in support. Are you thinking of what you are saying? You are actually saying women were made first and man must submit or it does not matter anymore. Women must be wives of one husband and lead their household well and their husbands must be respectful or it does not matter anymore. Listen, let us stop making sport at God. He has an order of things that he left with his apostle Paul to direct us in. Down and away with this woman pastors, down and away with this homosexual pastors because one deviation leads to the next. Down and away with your transgender elders and pastors. Down and away with this women elders. Down and away with this women deacons and your ordination of them. Away with that. These things are a corruption of what is written for our learning and direction. Stop claiming that God gave you this and that calling. How could God give a call to a homosexual pastor to lead congregation? How? How can an Anglican priest be married to a man and claim to be leading God's people? How could women now mount the pulpits as priests claiming to be called by God? You were called, but certainly not by God. Many people hear many things and voices, but God operates on a principle that he will not change. So go back and read Paul's letter to the Corinthians and to Timothy and tell me with hearts of hearts, with a clean, pure heart, where you find any support for women in leadership on behalf of God. Just show me. Stop twisting words to live out your, your narrative. Stop it. Verse 14, I am writing these things to you now, even though I hope to be with Soon. you, so that if I am delayed, you will know how people must conduct themselves in the household of God. This is the assembly of the living God, which is the pillar and foundation of the truth. Without question, this is the great mystery of our faith. Christ was revealed in a human body and vindicated by the Spirit. He was seen by angels and announced to the nations. He was believed in throughout the world and taken to heaven in glory. So what's the word mystery? Mystery means something that is hidden or secret. So Paul is saying that this is not widespread as it really should have been. Christ revealed in the flesh, who really believes that? Who really saw that? He was justified by angels, who knows that? 
He was announced to the nations by angels and to prophets. But who really heard that? Many people believe in him, but does the whole world do that? And he's ascended to heaven. How many people believe and accept that? So it is indeed a mystery, but the world through it will be saved. Amen. We go to 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars, and their consciences are dead. They will say it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat certain foods. But God created those foods to be eaten with Thanks by faithful people who know the truth. Since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanks. For we know it is made acceptable by the word of God and prayer. I'm not getting weary of repeating that which is truth. So I'm not weary of repeating that. Paul is saying to Timothy that there will be people who will say you should not get married. And there are some foods that are wrong to eat, clean and unclean. Now pray tell me, if I can't read English, aren't there people who still go about insisting that some foods are still considered unclean? So when I hammer home the point, don't think that I have nothing better to do. I need the point to be made all the time so that if this is the only study that you see, then you get the point. That is what Paul is saying. God created everything to be eaten with thanks or with thanksgiving and acceptable by prayer. There is absolutely no excuse for anyone in this day to tell you not to eat this and that. None. But still, there are people who would see this and being so indoctrinated, find it hard to walk away from this liars and hypocrites whose consciences are dead. So dead that they would not even reason to truth. They will condemn you as a heretic instead. Verse 6. If you explain these things to the brothers and sisters, Timothy, you will be a worthy servant of Christ Jesus. One who is nourished by the message of faith and the good teaching you have followed. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Wow. Don't study superstition and nonsensical arguments. They make no sense. Let me go back to it. What does eating all kinds of foods do to your spirituality or your salvation? Nothing. What does not eating all kinds of foods do to your salvation? Nothing. Cannot help you fight sin or temptation. So why are you placing this on people? Godless argument it is. Verse 8. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. This is why we work hard and continue to struggle, for our hope is in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and particularly of all believers. Amen. Train your mind, train your spiritual mind to understand godliness. Even if physical training is good, spiritual training is better. So keep at it. Everyone should accept this saying. Your hope is in Jesus and everyone should work towards that, not in trying to do anything based on some law. Verse 11, teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. Until I get there, focus on reading the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers and teaching them. So this was not a command given to the church to study the scriptures. This was given to Timothy 
to be diligent in studying the scripture so that he would be able to teach them to the congregation. Paul will soon be there so he can continue with his guidance. But for Timothy, he must continue to study. He must continue to teach. That means that he would have had to have scrolls available to him since there were no printed books available to the people. Verse 14, do not neglect the spiritual gift you received through the prophecy spoken over you when the elders of the church laid their hands on you. Give your complete attention to these matters. Throw yourself into your tasks so that everyone will see your progress. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. So Timothy is further admonished not to neglect his gift, which was spoken over his life when he was ordained or hands were laid on him. This is very crucial for he has to teach others so he must live what he preaches. Those who preach have to guard the avenues of their heart because the devil is always waiting to destroy. He will use your appetite to make you gluttonous. He will take your desire to be comfortable to make you love money. He will take your drinking and turn it to drunkenness. One has to be vigilant at all times. So those who minister, remember, you have a double responsibility, your salvation and that of those to whom you preach to. Let's pause here for now. By way of conclusion, we see Paul in a new letter written to Timothy to guide the congregation he left him with. He was young, so Paul was encouraging him to respect himself and others, but don't go having any foolish arguments with them and don't allow the church to do that or the congregation to do that. Salvation is in Jesus and it's freer than many make it to be. Do not let anyone place yokes upon anyone concerning marriage and food and do not let anyone despise you because you are young. Women, he told him, must not wear ornamentation of jewelry because it's unbecoming of godly women. Elders and deacons must be men above reproach and their wives must be respectful and hospitable. He did not say the opposite. So continue to study the scripture and be able to defend and teach the word of God. Your salvation depends on how you live after you have preached. What a wonderful way to encourage a young leader in Christ, one who will meet all kinds of wolves and lions, who would want to let him know that they have years of experience and he has a lot to learn. So I leave with you these words, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Let us keep holding and living our faith in Jesus, for one day, we will see him when he comes again. God be praised and stay safe and keep trusting. Let us pray. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for being so great and a wonderful God. We praise you for all that we have learned from Paul. And now from this letter to Timothy, we thank you for making some things so plain. May we continue to serve you no matter what. Bless us now as we go our different ways. For this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thanks again for watching. If you have been blessed, feel free to like, share, and subscribe if you have not yet done so. And as you do, may you rest in the wise, objective, resourceful, and definitive word of God.